You join us here on a glorious sunny February morning. We're here at the fantastic Lindome Lakes Complex. I'm sat on a lake here which is called Laurels and I've got a peg with loads and loads of options. So in this video we're just going to be going through some of the mistakes that it's really best to avoid during winter when you're tackling F1s and carp on the feeder. The peg that I'm faced with today is a very, very interesting one. One of the things that we notice is that at this time of year, lots of fishery managers and, and, um, and match organisers, they understand that it's often best to give the anglers a little bit more room. So it's quite common on lots of matches, particularly on this complex as well, where you could easily have the next peg available. and Sometimes even two pegs either side of you because they space the anglers out to help the fishing. So that inevitably means quite often you've got a lot more options and that's where a lot of people can go wrong. It can be a little bit confusing sometimes just knowing where to start, where you plan to finish the match and how you actually work your way around a swim. You know it's swim management and it's watercraft and that can be so important um, going through winter you know and on a peg like this I mean looking at the peg now I'm already thinking about how I'm going to tackle it so for me a peg like this you've just got so many options but the way that i would approach this sort of a swim particularly the way that we've been approaching this venue through this last winter is we generally start in an area where you want to nick one or two early fish you know you want to start in an area where if you do hook a fish or you have a run of fish where it's still going to leave areas of the swim undisturbed because what you've got to think about is that yes if you start in one spot and the tip keeps going around you keep catching happy days but let's face it how realistic and how often does that happen so you've got to think about where you're going to progress to okay and that's the area and that's the, the bit that a lot of people kind of sometimes struggle with so a peg like this today i mean i'm really looking forward to tackling it for me the way that i would approach this is i am going to start at the front edge of this island i'm going to drop the method feeder just off the front of that island i'm not going to go too close because the water's very shallow and start down the slope a little bit and the reason why I'm going to start there is because I'm going to try and catch one or two early fish. Because if I do hook fish there, I'm only disturbing the water from that point back to me as I'm playing the fish. So that means that all that area from the front of the island right to the back of the island is all undisturbed. So if the fish are going to back off, I've got areas where I can progress to after that initial area that I've started in, if that makes sense. So that's generally the way that we think in winter. Okay, if I carry on catching at the front of the island, brilliant, but that doesn't happen very often. So I'm going to try and catch what I can there. And what I've actually got here is I've actually got two sides of the island to tattle, which isn't uncommon on venues like this. So I've got to think about which way I am going to go. If I'm going to progress the feeder out, I can go to the left or I can go to the right. For me today, as you can see, there's a bit of a breeze blowing and that breeze is blowing into this island from this direction. So for me, my decision today is going to be once I've caught there or hopefully I've caught there I'm going to work my way along that island working my way out to that far corner of the island and just catch what I can catch what I can and if it dries up or I stop catching I'll just progress that little bit further so that is easily going to give me easy an hour and a half into the session or even two hours depending on how good or bad it is whilst I'm doing that I can obviously keep this left hand side of the island in my mind as well now that area there I'm going to leave quiet and that's because as you can see we've got bright sunshine it's slightly out of the wind so we obviously know through underwater filming and things that we've suspected over the years is that the water behind that island could actually be a degree or two warmer certainly as the day progresses you know if the sun carries on it's going to warm up the shallow water so that is an area I can always target at any time once I've caused all this disturbance to this side so that is going to be a key quiet area that I'm going to leave once I've gone out to the far edge of the island, my next option is I've got all this open water here. Loads of open water. I can then, if it dries up on that line, I can drop the feeder in different areas, all in this open water. So that's easy, going to give me two to three hours of, of fishing time into the match. I've got loads of options there, and if the fish are going to be backing off, I've got a nice, clear plan of where I'm going to be chasing them. Now, one thing that we do see, and I've seen on this fishery this winter, is that if you can feed an area, certainly for the last two hours or an hour and a half when the fish are generally a little bit more confident the water might be a little bit warmer then the light levels start to go that is when they can often go on the feed so that is what sometimes what we refer to as a throwaway line and that's what i'm going to do today this area on my left in this open water i'm going to loose feed some corn i can do that via catapult whilst i'm fishing the other method and i won't even go on that for the first half of the session 
I'm going to go on that, certainly in the last two hours. And if the fish do decide to feed, I've got that option covered. And because of where it's fed, it's out of the way. It's not going to interfere with all this main area. So if it doesn't produce anything, it's not ruined this part of, of your match. It's a throwaway line. And then by that stage, if we are catching there, we'll keep catching. If not, the last hour is very, very important. We know about margins in summer. The same applies in winter. And that's happened on this venue through this winter on just about every match I've fished here, I have caught down the margins later on. So I will be feeding an area to target in that last hour. I don't know if it's gonna be the right hand margin or the left. The reason why I don't know that is because there's no difference between them today. However, what I will do, I won't be feeding it until the second half of the session. And by then I will know which margin has had most disturbance. So for example, if I've caught more fish here and this margin has seen a lot of disturbance where I've been netting fish, I'll choose to fish down that margin in the last hour and vice versa if I end up catching fish at this side and there's more disturbance here where I'm netting fish I'll choose this margin to feed later on because it's going to be the quietest it's pretty much like a game of chess you're thinking about your next move all the time hopefully you don't have to go down all these stages because you're catching fish early on but as we all know and we've seen it certainly this winter the first two hours can almost be a waste of time because the fish don't even feed until the second half but unfortunately, a lot of people, even within the first half an hour of a match, have kind of killed all these options and then they've got nowhere to go. So I can't wait to get on the box. I'm really looking forward to seeing if what we plan is going to work. And um, I'm sure we're going to find some fish somewhere. One of the things that's so important in winter is the size of feeder that you pick. You know, they, there are several reasons why a smaller feeder can be far better in winter. The main one, obviously, that you'll think about is the volume of bait that you're actually feeding. Now, this is something that, you know, we could have a, a really long discussion about this, but basically, by just putting a small amount of feed in, particularly when you're going to be mobile, it's very important because, you know, I'm 20 minutes into this session now and I've already put this feeder in three different places. If I was doing that with a really large feeder, as you can imagine, as the session progresses, you're leaving pellets all over your swim, you know, and you don't really want to do that. What you want to be doing is just setting up a trap. Now, this is a 20 gram inter size open method feeder. So that's just telling you exactly what, what feeder this one is that I'm using. And as you can see, that's pretty much the size of, a, of an F1 or a carp's mouth, isn't it? That is a trap. The idea is that lays on the bottom, the carp comes over there, or the F1, it doesn't grab it with its lips, it opens its mouth, it's the suction that sucks those pellets in. That is just the right size for a carp. So the chances of your hook bait getting sucked in there is very, very high, you know, and that's what you're trying to do. The reason why we scale the feeder down as well is not only because of the volume of the size, it's the actual weight as well. The wind has dropped at the moment, it's flat calm, and you're going looking for fish. We're being mobile, we're looking for fish. So it doesn't make sense that if you're gonna to cast to an area where you think there might be a fish, why would you crash a big heavy feeder over the top of it? You're only gonna spook the fish, aren't you? Particularly in winter. So that again, that's the, it's not only the size of the feeder, it's the weight that's important because you wanna be trying to plop it in nicely so it's nice and discreet. And on this particular session, just like I do in lots of, lots of different venues, I'm actually timing my casts. Now the timing of your cast is something that, you know, it's not for everybody, but I do it not because it's something that I stick to religiously, I just do it as a guide. Like today, for example, I've already had three, three casts, you know, and I'm leaving it in 10 minutes or so, eight to 10 minutes, and it's just a guide. And that's a guide because if I don't get any bites within eight to 10 minutes, I can, you know, give myself the option of saying, well, I'm gonna leave it in 15 minutes this time or I can go to 20 minutes. Sometimes in winter, we might even be leaving it in 30 minutes. And it's amazing, I've tested this on myself and I know lots of people have done it. It's amazing how easy it is when you're sat here with your hands in your pockets, drinking coffee, having a chat to the lad at the next peg, how you can lose track of time. I've tested it for myself and it's amazing how you do lose track of time. So by time in your cast, it just gives you a guide. It gives you something to work to. So by scaling the feeder down in size and the weight, and being mobile, it can just be a great, nice little discreet way of going looking for fish where you're just presenting a mouthful of bait in each spot that you're trying.
Well, I've got to admit, I honestly thought that was a liner. It's taken over a minute for me to decide to pick up on that. I was just getting really slow indications. I was convinced that it was a fish brushing against the line. And that's gone on for over a minute before it actually went. It obviously says that the fish was hooked, but it just shows that the hair rig's done its job. And just not to snatch at it, you know, if it was a fish going against the line, if I'd picked up and struck and it wasn't uh, hooked, then I could have spooked that fish and it could have ruined it. Just be nice and patient this time of year. With a hair rig, it should be hooked. All you've got to do is pick up and play the fish. It's a nice chunky F1. Freezing cold, as you'd expect, but that's a nice start. That's our fourth spot that we put the feeder in. So obviously I'm going to go back to that same spot, see if we can throw any more fish there. If not, I'll just repeat the process and start looking elsewhere in the swim. But we're off the mark, that's a good start. And I'm sure we're going to find some more somewhere else in the swim. Well, that has been in exactly 10 minutes. And whilst I've had a couple of little indications, certainly nothing to pick up on, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the rod has just wrenched right round. Unbelievable. Sometimes this time of year, you won't think there was a fish there and all of a sudden the rod goes, you know, but we're fishing a self-hooking way of fishing. And that's what can happen. When the fish does get hooked, it bolts out the swim. And that's why using things like this are so important. It's just for it to, to, to grab the butt of the rod and the position of that front feeder rest is so important. I've seen people have them too low or they've got a flat one. That's how they lose tackle. I saw two rods lost last year by people fishing like this. And obviously undoing the drag as well. When you're unclipped, you can undo the drag. It's not an issue. There we go. So that's the second fish. That's the next cast. Again, the same spot, just to the back edge of the island. So in a match or a normal session like this, obviously we'll go back to that same spot again and just catch what we can from it. We're only just over an hour into the session and we've still got all this open water to target. Hopefully we'll catch more on that spot and we haven't even been to either of the two left-hand swims and we've still got the margin to go to. We've got two fish in the net and we've still got loads of options. One of the things I love about fishing these venues, especially in winter, is how simple the bait tray can be. It's been a really refreshing change for me this winter because all these baits are pretty much, pretty much what we refer to as shelf life baits. Okay, we've got, at this fishery, you've got to use fishery only pellets. So I've quite simply got some micro pellets or the fishery only micro pellets, all right. Those have been soaked for exactly five minutes. I've done those this morning. I've done them for five minutes and about three quarters of an hour after that I've obviously drained the water off I've had to add a tiny little bit more water to them just because they're drying out in the sun and, and because of the wind but that's something that you have to do anyway normally I do like to soak them the night before uh, I'll soak them the night before drain the water off put them in a bag drain the air out put them in a bag put them in the fridge and usually when I get to the match the next day they are perfect and I don't have to touch them all day so that's the key bait on here the next one I've got I've got some corn that's just some F1, one tin of F1 corn that I'm loose feeding there, covered up in water. I do that for two reasons, stop the corn drying out and floating, but because it's in water, it does highlight any floating ones as well. So if there are the odd one that's floating, you can just pour that off and drain it off. And then the final bait that I've got actually got on the side tray are basically hook baits. I've got a nice little selection here, mainly band and wafters. I've got some eight mils, they're obviously much probably the biggest bait that I tend to use in winter particularly on a venue like this I've got there are some minis on there and I've also got some micros as well we've learnt over the years that sometimes particularly on F1 venues sometimes the smallest bait you can get away with is, is, is the best better you know sometimes particularly if you're catching smaller F1s a smaller hook bait is, is better because they could just suck the bait in much easier and it's more similar of a weight and size to the actual micro pellets that they're ultimately homing in on 
and that's you know that's basically it what i have during winter however with wafters with bandoms whatever sort of hook bait you're using i do always like to test them actually on the hair rig within the tub of water that i've got here and i do always test what my feeder is actually emptying like so all i basically do is i've got the open style method feeder the intersize i like to put one small layer or shallow layer of pellets on there and i like to press those on really really hard because they're the ones that are going to they're the ones that are going to expand and push out the ones on top so it's not all about the top layer i then lay the hook bait in there don't press the hook in it's very very important we have caught fish today in under two minutes and if you press your hook into the pellets if a quick fish or a fish comes in quickly to the feeder if your hook's pressed in there into the pellets you're not going to get a proper hook up are you because the hook is still going to be pressed into those pellets for a little while until the pellets have had a chance to break down and once i've done that i simply make sure that the line is coming out at the bottom of the feeder out of the way so that if a fish comes in it's not brushing against this line here to spook it which we know can make a difference and then i like to just cover the feeder and the hook bait with a final layer of pellets and i always like to leave just a little bit of the wafter showing through i just think sometimes sometimes it's just a visual thing you know if you are going to get a quick fish that comes in it could see that particularly in clear water and then what i would do i always do this before every session before every match and i sometimes do it during the match is simply drop it into the water and just time how long it takes for the pellets to expand off the feeder and how long it's going to be before my hook and hook bait is exposed Well, we've gone back to that same spot. I've got to admit, I have lost a fish because of the line that I'm fishing on. The fish carted to the left and it actually snagged me up. I lost the hook length. So this will be the fourth hooked fish in that spot. It just shows you, you know, we had three or four other casts without any sign really of a fish. And we've gone to that spot and we've had four fish. Well, we've hooked four fish from that one spot. In fact, this one's a bream. I didn't expect that. Obviously on these fisheries you never know what you're really going to hook, do you? Well, that makes a nice change. There we go. On a nice bright yellow, yellow bandom. Look yeah, at that beauty. Certainly not a nuisance fish, as you can imagine. You know, in matches on venues like this and those quiet spells when you're not catching. If you could put a few of those in the net as well, which we now refer to as accidents, <laughs> they're very, very welcome. You know, you can easily put an extra five or even 10 pound in your net. And, you know, sometimes that can be all the difference in winter. So that's four fish we've had, or four fish we've hooked from that one spot. So we're getting to midway in the session now. Obviously, I'm gonna go back there again, see what we catch what we want. We've now been feeding this corn area for two hours. I haven't been on it. The key with a line like that can be timing, just like with margins, because in an ideal world, I don't want to go on that line. And if there are going to be some fish there, I don't want to catch just one and then nothing. When I go on that line, ideally, I'd like there to be three, four, five fish settled on there, grazing, so that when I hook one, hopefully you're going to go on and catch four or five. And that's where your timing comes into it, you know. Um, but I'm going to leave that a little bit longer. Like I say, that sort of swim is for the last two hours of a session or a match. I still haven't tried this bay there. So I'm going to catch what I can here and then once this dries up, which I'm sure it will do at some stage, that's when we're going to have a look at that corn line and start thinking about setting up the margin. I've got to admit that I've had a couple of issues with a bit of a snag on that line. I've hooked four fish on that spot, but there is something coming back a little bit. So I decided to have a complete stray cast. So I've gone on the same line to the back of that island, but about probably two meters to the right, so that I'm no longer near that line or that snag area where the, my line was running through. And that, <laughs> was in one minute and 50 seconds and it's gone straight round so obviously that could just be a stray fish we found an extra fish which is always good but that same spot now might produce another little runner fish before we start looking at these other areas it's another f1 same same hook bait 
and like I say, I mean, one minute 50, <laughs> that's fast even by summer standards. But what that also shows you, which I think it is important, it's not something lots and lots of people talk about, and that is on my side tray, you may have noticed that I've got a tub of water. And this is so important at any time of year, but particularly in winter. And that is when you're, pulling, you're putting your pellets on your feeder, you've really got to have an idea of how quick the pellets are actually breaking down and coming off the feeder. You know, I know for a fact there are some scenarios where I fish, if I was casting at range, if I'd soak my pellets in a different way, there's no way that within a minute and 50 seconds, my pellets would have broken down and the hook bait would have been exposed. It wouldn't. However, on a day like today, I'm only casting 20, 25 meters. It's very shallow. You don't need to pack your pellets on too tight, but the only way I know how quick they're breaking down is by testing them in this tub of water. That's why we've always got a tub of water next to us because the water temperature, the amount of time that you soak your pellets, it all has an impact on how quick they're going to be breaking down. And that has obviously told us that it is breaking down. It looks like in the tub, it's breaking down after about 30 seconds. So that's just proved obviously that the fish can get to the bait in under two minutes, which at certain times of year can be key. But obviously when you see it in a tub at the side of you, how quick it's actually breaking down for real, well that helps your confidence, doesn't it? Because it knows that you're not sat waiting for a bite where you think the first two or three minutes, your bait's not even exposed. It just helps your confidence. And the tub of water also lets you see how your wafter's behaving. Well, first cast on the corn line. It's been out there probably three or four minutes without a sign. I thought if there were any there, I would have had some sort of a liner or indication. Is it a bream? It's a bream. Fancy that, catching a bream on a corn line. That's not rare, is it? But it just shows you, you know, we've fed that line out of the way. I don't know if we're gonna get any more on it, but it's only been there three minutes or so, and I've got an extra couple of pound in the net. You know, and the other thing as well is while I'm on that line, I'm also resting the line that I have been catching on. So, you know, by having what we call a throwaway line, quite often it doesn't make any difference to your main areas. And if it does turn out to be a day when the fish do want to see a bit of feed and they are going to get their heads down, it's just a great way of covering your options. And the other thing that's great, I'm still only using one rod. I've actually got one rod, one set up, and I'm fishing about five different areas of the of the swim, a lovely nine foot rod. I mean, you can't get much simpler than that, can you? So I'm gonna go back to that same spot. I'm not gonna lose feed any corn. I fed, the, fed quite heavy with corn, to be fair, for how many bites we've had, but I did wanna feed it positive. So I'm not gonna feed it now while I'm fishing it because I wanna catch whatever's there. And all I'm doing is underarming and just feathering it so it's going in nicely onto that area. Right where I've been loose feeding and with these keep nets, the beautiful thing is they've got a lovely slot in the middle for the rod, which means I don't have to move my feeder arm or my feeder rest for that line or any of the swims to this side. I could put my rod, nice nine foot rods, nice for this. And I've got a lovely angle in the tip and the rod sits there nicely. Again, I've got the drag undone. You've always got to do that. And that is it. Don't tighten up to it too much because I don't want any fish getting caught up on the line and foul looking them or getting them to move the feeder if they get caught up on the line. The fish are going to be self-hooking. If they hook themselves against that, that feeder, you're going to know about it. So I'd just like to leave a bit of slack line. So that's it. I'll just see if we can get another fish off it. Well, this is my second cast on the corn line. And to be fair, I am getting the odd little indication but this has been in, well, it's just come, well, it's eight minutes now it's actually been in. And whilst I'm getting the odd little indication, I'm not entirely convinced that they're carp or F1s. We've already had one fish on here and it was a skimmer. So there may be one or two skimmers milling them about. But one thing to remember, you know, we talk about things in winter and just like in summer, it's quite easy, particularly when you get one first cast on a line like this, to, to flog it, to lose track of time and just kind of keep going on it, keep going on it. 
And sometimes, you know, you've just got to try and show a little bit of discipline because I could easily lose 20 minutes, half an hour on this line without it producing anything just because I'm getting a few indications. Now, had I not caught elsewhere in the swim and got those fish in the net already elsewhere, then I might be more entitled or more um, inclined to sit on this line a little bit longer. But when we know we've caught more fish elsewhere, I don't want to flog this. So I'm going to put a little bit more corn on it, give it another minute or two, and then go back out there and wait until it's time to drop on this again in a little while after a rest, and then we can think about the margin. Well, after looking on the corn line and just having one fish, we went back long, if you want to call it that, had a couple of fish, then it went quiet, so then we had a quick look down this margin and actually caught a hybrid. It was only there about three minutes. We caught a nice stamp hybrid, and that was a single fish as well. So I've gone back out long again to where we caught that first run of fish, and this has been out there, it's been out there about eight minutes, but we found another fish, and from nowhere, just nearly pulled a rod in. So it's definitely been an example of being mobile, but also resting areas as well. The rest has definitely helped this longer line each time we've rested it. As we've got another plane going over, they've been busy today. This is a hard fighting fish. Come on, mate. He doesn't want to give up this one. But rest, resting areas, as we know, are very important all year round, but especially in winter, you know. And if you're going to be catching fish as well, obviously just catching a fish is causing disturbance and can cause fish to, to move to other areas of your, of your swim and the lake as well. But that's a nice fish to finish on. This has really just been... It's just been showing you an example of how, in lots of cases, you can literally ruin a session in the first 10 or 20 minutes. It's about having a starting point, but then it's also about having options and areas that you can fish later on in the match. You know, it's a five hour match, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, when you're catching fish like that, even if you're only catching one of those every 20 minutes, it's quite easy to build up a, a weight. And if you can catch them throughout the session, rather than just starting somewhere, blowing your peg straight away, and then hoping you're gonna get a good run later on down the margin. Well, we can all do that, can't we? And let's face it, how often does that happen? But if you've got ways of picking off odd fish throughout a session, you're building up a weight that's gonna go with anything that you might catch in that last period. And that's really what can make all the difference, particularly during winter. So just ease your way into it. You know, ease your way into it. That way, if you do make a mistake, you haven't ruined the whole of the swim. You've still got other areas to go to. And don't forget that on days like today, the sun's over here now, it started over there. There will be areas of the swim that are warmer now because the sun's been on them all day. There are areas where we haven't disturbed. And so by having those options, you've got plenty of options, plenty of, plenty of options to take you through a five hour match rather than just trying to catch everything straight away. So I hope you've enjoyed this bit of an insight into how we tackle venues like this. We really hope it's going to help you catch more fish through the colder months. And we just want to say thank you for joining us. Thanks for watching. And we look forward to seeing you next time.